So I want to welcome all of you. Good morning or good afternoon. I'm Danny Rubin, the founder of our company, which is Rubin, just like my last name. And we provide an online curriculum for business communication skills. Teachers, give me a show of hands. How many students send you emails that sometimes look like text messages? See some hands there? <laughs> and many times you would prefer to send text messages than speak to people on the phone, right? And so what we teach as a company are practical skills for learning how to write and speak to open doors for opportunities. And that's what you can expect from us through our webinars today. We're going to be teaching how to communicate with professionals and hearing from two great experienced nursing professionals in just a few minutes. Prior to that, for those of you who have been here before, you know what we like to do. We always like to give out some free resources to take back to the classroom, virtual or otherwise, right now. How many of you are brand new to our webinars? Who's here as a first timer? Tell us in the chat. Who's new? Me, me, me. New, new, new. <laughs> All right. And how many have been here before? <laughs> I can't even read all these chats. So I, I know there's some returning folks and there's some new people. So for the new teachers, and even ones who have been here before, you may not have this particular resource we're gonna give out. So let me share my screen, get my chat going. You can see my screen okay? Everybody can see the, the uh, PowerPoint screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the first giveaway, if you don't have it yet, We've put together a virtual internship guide for how to engage with employers, learning how to request a Q&A with a professional, prepare for a Q&A or go on a virtual tour, hold a Q&A with a professional like we're going to do today, write a thank you email afterwards, and even how to describe these experiences on your resume and cover letter. So this is like a Google folder packet we've put together for teachers. In addition, if you don't have this yet, we give it away every time because it is that important. We've put together a Google folder of email etiquette lessons. Take a look at the readings and the short activities where we are teaching students not to send emails like text messages, write subject lines, address people appropriately, email bodies, email signatures. And when students finish the work, they can earn a digital badge. Teachers, raise your hand. Is anybody familiar with digital badges? Have you used digital badges before? I see some hands. You can, students can place it on their resume or e-portfolio or LinkedIn profile. Okay, so if you're interested in these resources, here's all you have to do. You need to go to the chat and type your name and your email address. Name and email address, that's all you have to do. Please put your name and your email address as well, not just your name, your name and email. And we will pass this along in the next day or so. What we like to do for new people, listen closely, for new people, for new teachers, this is just for teachers, okay, not students, they'll get it down to you, don't worry. We are going to have, we'd like to have a brief couple of minute phone call to learn about your program, help you make use of this content in the smartest ways possible. So you'll see a Google invitation from us in the next day or so to help you to integrate this into your classroom and to un understand who you are. We can't talk and have a real conversation right now and we certainly wanna do that, okay? So name and email and we'll get it out to you as soon as possible. And also, if you're okay with a discussion on Martin Luther King Day, which is Monday, Make a note of that, please, because I know schools are closed, but if you're around and you'd like to talk that day because it's quiet, make a note that MLK Day is okay. All right? Okay. Now, please continue to do that. That's perfectly fine. I want to mention, because we always have a next one, right? Always have a next one. And our next one's going to be great as well. On the 28th of January, in two weeks from now or so, at 1230, a little bit earlier, we're gonna talk about exploring the world of the trades. We're gonna to talk to Chuck Little and Corey Collier. They both work in 
the electrical contracting world, and they're going to talk about the world of apprenticeship, which is a very popular path to go into a trade. And you can make as much as $60,000 a year after five years just going through the apprenticeship program and going to work in that trade. So we're going to talk all about getting into an apprentice program or learning a trade and making that your career. So please share this with teachers. You'll see it go out tomorrow when we send out the recording of today's webinar. Please tell teachers in your school about this one. We'd love to have them or in you, but we're going to keep mixing it up with different uh, occupations and the 28th is all about the trades. And as a reminder, everyone today who is here with us, we're sending you a certificate a certificate showing you were here, you can put it on your, in a portfolio, you can put it in, you know, in uh, applications, teachers can use it as well for continuing education credit. So that's coming your way as well tomorrow morning. The recording and the certificate tomorrow morning. People often ask, where's the recording? Where's the recording? The tomorrow morning, okay? Not today, but tomorrow. Now, before we bring in our guests, I wanna point out one other thing, share my screen once more and help everyone understand where is all this instruction coming from and what is this Rubin company, if you may be learning for the first time. So our, our company provides a curriculum called Emerge. There may be some teachers here today who use Emerge with their students alongside these webinars. And Emerge is a broad platform, a giant resource bank teaching communication skills. Okay, delivering it to in through your own learning management system, whether it's Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoology. What, what learning management system do you use? Tell us in the chat, which one do you use in your classroom? So in here, we provide exercises appropriate for middle school through college, different exercise for different audiences, okay, as well as for transition populations and students with IEPs, teaching email etiquette, life skills, phone and video etiquette, networking skills, resumes, cover letters, internship and job outreach, LinkedIn profiles, job interview prep. For those of you who teach or discuss entrepreneurship, we teach business ideas, sales writing, website page writing, public relations, fundraising communication. And I always ask, who, is, who here is an advisor to a CTSO like HOSA or DECA or student council? Put us in the chat. What, what, what do you advise or what are you a member of as a student? We have exercises to teach leadership skills, like management writing, client communication, project management communication, public speaking, report writing, and activities for students in leadership roles. So a big, broad menu of topics. And we're gonna give you some samples in those Google folders from our broader curriculum, okay? So that's what I wanted to touch upon. And now what I'd like to do is I'm gonna turn off my share and we're gonna bring in our special guests. We are delighted to have Nurse Michelle Tinner and Nurse Hillary Weller to be with us today. And what I'm going to first do is have them introduce themselves, explain the type of work that they do. And then I have a question for them. And then I'm going to open it up to the questions in the Q&A. So you can start to put your questions in the Q&A. And we will get to those in just a moment. Let me start with Nurse Tinner. Tell us about, you have a lot of uh, abbrevi abbreviations after your name, first of all. Okay, <laughs> tell us what those all mean and tell us the work that you do today in the world of nursing and health science. Yes, well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Michelle Tenner. Um, I'm the owner of Love Thy Neighbor Home Care Agency in Virginia and Angels on Hand in Maryland. Um, my abbreviations, I have um, a master's degree in healthcare administration, business administration. Um, I received that in 2017. Um, in 2015, I received a bachelor's degree um, in science of nursing. And in um, 2012, I became a registered nurse. Um, I've been a nurse for more than 20 years. I started out as a CNA. And um, I was a CNA in 2000. In 2003, I became an LPN. And um, in 2012, I became a registered nurse. Um, with my home care agency, Love Thy Neighbor, what I do is I train um, family members for free to be PCAs. And I hire PCAs and CNAs to go to the homes of our elderly and disabled um, population and provide assistance for per personal care services, um, such as bathing, dressing, grooming, um, 
transfer and ambulation. We provide services to keep loved ones, um, our clients safe in the community. Um, um, so that's what I, I do. I've been doing it for three years. Uh, I enjoy what I do. And um, I started basically because of my mom, um, taking care of my mom. Um, with my mom um, having heart condition and heart problems and not having the best insurance, um, growing up, me and my brother would go to different hospitals and I realized that because my mom did not have insurance, um, my mom did not receive the best care. So growing up, I figured, I learned, you know, with the care that my mom received, uh, whether you have insurance or not, everyone should be treated with dignity and respect and have the best in, in services for health care. Um, and that's what made me decide to become a nurse. And, um, with me, with my company, I have over 200 clients and I have 270 employees. Um, wow. in my so I try to incorporate that every day. Wow. Okay, everybody. I want to stop for a second. We, we want this to be a teaching session. Did she just said, I heard a couple of numbers. Did you hear how many clients she has? What number did she just say how, how many clients she has? Not 756. There we go. <laughs> Two, 200. Very good. We talk a lot in here about the power of numbers. Owning your numbers. The numbers that you have. Those are her numbers. And they mean a lot. 200 clients is a lot of clients. That's a tremendous accomplishment. We're going to listen for numbers today. All right. Nurse Weller, tell us all about you. Um, I work in the ER at a level one trauma center. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and then decided to switch over to nursing um, about five years ago. Um, so I have a bachelor's degree in nursing as well. And I have been in the ER ever since graduating uh, four and a half years ago. And um, I love what I do. We, we see a little bit of everything. So um, I feel like I never lose my skills there. You have a little bit of OB, a little bit of psych, a little bit of everything that, that you study in nursing school. So you, you just never know what you're going to get, and it keeps you on your toes every day. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do first, those of you you may have seen come through, we put together a worksheet, right? Some of you may have, may have our worksheet. If not, we'll bring the questions out during the chat, and you can answer them on your own. But the first thing that we put in the worksheet is a couple of links to each of their places of work, okay? And I wanna share my screen. I, again, I wanna to demonstrate to you, this is not just a listen to a career day talk, okay? I want you to learn how to talk to adults, how to talk to professionals to make a strong impression. So let's say that you are going to meet one of them for a potential job. Well, Nurse Weller works for Centera Norfolk General Hospital. And when I went to the website, one of the first things I noticed is right here, Nightingale Regional Air Ambulance. That made me very curious. And that might mean a helicopter. So my question to Nurse Weller is, do you ever engage with the helicopter that might bring patients to your hospital? Can you tell me about that? Yes, we do. Um, we, most often, if, if the helicopter is flying to us, it's flying to bring patients to the ER uh, more often than not. So I actually flew with them one time as well, which was an extraordinary experience. Um, and you can actually apply as a student to do that as well. Um, but most often they're, they're flying patients from either other hospitals or homes or the middle of a highway and airlifting them um, because they, they can't wait for um, you know, transport any other way. So they bring them to the ER and we take care of them from there. Wow. Students, raise your hand if you'd like to experience going on a helicopter to help somebody in need. Wow, what an amazing experience that would be, right? And again, I asked that question. Somebody tell me in the chat, what did I do to learn how to ask that question? Can someone tell me? What did I do? What did I have to do first? Where did I go on the internet? What did I do? I really want you to understand. I did research, thank you. Those of you who've been here before, we always talk about researching people. It shows we care about them before we can expect them to care about us. That's an important life skill. Now, let me share again. And we're going to hop over to Love Thy Neighbor, which is Nurse Tenner's business. Okay, and I was you know, reading, and you mentioned before, a lot of your services, bathing, dressing, grooming. And my question to you by reading about it is, what are some of the most popular services that you're asked for to service those 200 customers, those clients? 
Mm -hmm. The most popular is bathing and um, dressing. Um, most of our clients um, are discharged from the hospital. So after they um, go to the ER and Ms. Hillary take care of them, and then when they go home, we continue that care. So if they had surgery or not feeling well, they discharge and go home their week and we help with bathing and getting out of bed. So the um, that's the most popular. Also respite. Um, like myself, I was a caregiver for my mom for 12 years. And, um, and being a caregiver, sometimes you need a break. You need to get away and get some free time. So another popular service is respite. Uh, we have aides that come into home to basically supervise, be with that client so they're not at home by themselves to allow the family member or whoever's in the home to go out for a couple of hours, um, sometimes uh, overnight, so they can get that break. Wow, thank you very much. Very, and you know, I was about to ask you because you said respite and I wasn't quite clear what respite meant, but then you defined it for me. But for the students, it's okay if someone says a word you don't understand or an abbreviation, it's okay to say, do you mind telling me what that is? Because that's how we learn and nobody expects you to know everything, but they like to see that you're curious, right? That's, that you're interested in learning. So let me go to the chat. We have a lot of different questions kind of around the same topic. So I'll start calling students out by name in a minute. But the first question is, if you're interested in becoming a nurse, what would be the first step? Let's say the student is in high school or college. What would you say, we'll start with Nurse Weller, and you can both answer this, but give me a quick answer on how would you get started? Where would you even begin? Uh, so the first step I would say is, is um, prerequisites. You know, to get into any nursing school, you have to start with your prerequisites, microbiology, anatomy and physiology, the really nice thing about nursing is you don't have to pick your specialty until you graduate from nursing school. So everybody goes to the exact same school. Uh, I mean, not the same school, but everybody does the same curriculum for nursing. Um, and then it's only after you graduate do you pick your specialty. So I would start by researching schools nearby or online that you can start taking your prerequisites at. Wonderful. Nurse Tenner, what would you say to that? I agree with Hillary on um, your prereq, especially your math and your English. Um, but if you want to be a nurse, like for myself, I started out as a CNA because um, I did not know for sure if I wanted to be a nurse. I also wanted to be a um, computer programmer like my aunt. So I said, well, let me start out as a CNA and see if I like it. Um, so it just any field, especially with nursing, you really have to care. Um, you really have to enjoy what you're doing because in this particular field, you have to be non-judgmental. When you're providing care for whoever, whether um, if you're in a home, like myself, or if you're in a hospital with Ms. Hillary, you have to be non-judgmental. You're here to provide a service. You're here to have that client to feel better, a patient to feel better. So you have to have a caring spirit and a caring heart. Because again, we need more people like that in the field, not just somebody to be a nurse, somebody to be a nurse, but actually care about what they do. Wonderful. Thank you both. And I want to point out on our worksheet, or you can do it on your own, one of our questions is, what is one interesting fact you've learned about either one of our guests today? So as you're listening, write down something you find interesting that they do or that they've done. And a question for Nurse Tenner real quick, because again, I want to make sure that we're not afraid to ask questions. So you said CNA. Can you tell me what a CNA stands for? Yes, thank you. Um, CNA is Certified Nursing Assistant. Um, for you. CNAs, you mostly can, um, when you become a CNA, you can work in the nursing home, um, you can work in assisted living, and in some cases, like Centura, you can work in the hospital, I believe, as a nursing care partner. Um, so a CNA is a Certified Nursing Assistant, and then after that, I became an LPN, uh, which is a lic licensed practical nurse. Thank you very much. It's, it's important to know what these terms mean, especially if we're hearing them for the first time. And I saw some people asking in the, in the chat. So that's great. Okay, so we have a question from a young woman named Sophia Familia. And if you could, if you're in the chat, if you can hear me, tell me what school you're from, that'd be great. And she asked how it has been managing what you do despite COVID. That's sort of the, the big question first, right? I mean, it's impacted the medical field as much as any type of work that we do in society. So let me start with Nurse Tenner first. Tell me within your home health business, how has COVID impacted your day-to-day -day and how you treat your patients and your, your clients? 
Um, good question. Um, it's impacted me a lot and my aides. Um, what I do is I typically supply gloves for my aides anyway, but since COVID, I also provide them with um, masks um, and hand sanitizer because I want my aides to be safe. I want them to be comfortable and I want my clients to be comfortable. Um, with my aides providing care in the home, um, we came across clients who became positive with COVID. So of course, you know, we have to get the aid tested to make sure that they didn't have COVID. So it's a lot of testing, a lot of out of pocket stuff. But again, I believe in um, doing what's right for my aides. I always believe if you do right by your aides, your aides will do right by you. So um, I'm hope that this COVID will hurry up and end. <laughs> but in the meantime, my main priority is making sure that my clients are safe and my aides are safe. Also, I do in services with my aides, especially about COVID, the signs and symptoms of COVID. If you feel that you have any symptoms before you even get tested, contact me and let me know so you can quarantine because what I don't want is someone, to, one of my aides to feel like they have a cold or they feel like, well, I think I'm okay and you providing care for the client and then you find out that you have COVID. You know, that's not good for you and that's not good for the client. Also, we had to um, do some teaching with our clients to let us know if you're not feeling well, give us a call and let us know so we won't send the aid in the home. So it's a lot of paperwork with in services for the clients and also for the aides and also a lot of supplies but in the long run, it's, it's going to help everyone out. Thank you very much for that. Nurse Weller, how would you respond? You're in the ER, okay? So you're you know, right there with patients. They may, have you treated COVID patients? And what has it been like in that experience the last several months? Yes, um, I've treated a lot of COVID patients. Um, it's, been, it, it's been difficult, but um, I have a very strong team that I'm grateful for. Um, and, and I think that that makes all the difference. And part of what we do, we have a, a whole new process of triaging patients, which is, um, you know, they come into the ER and there's a nurse out front who decides who is the sickest and what symptoms are people having. So based on the symptoms they present, we try to isolate, um, you know, the COVID symptom patients to a different section of the ER. Um, we also have a heated tent outside, but basically isolating those patients to keep them from getting other patients sick. Um, the other big change that we've had that's been difficult for a lot of families is, is we are no longer allowing visitors. And that has been a huge um, just obstacle to get around. My, my grandfather actually passed away from COVID without any visitors um, at his wow. bedside. Wow. So, um, it's a very sensitive topic and we try to be sensitive to families and make them um, able to speak to their loved ones, whether it's from FaceTime or on the phone, or you are that middleman of communication between them and their families. Um, so those are probably the biggest changes that we've had. Wow, you're having, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. And a lot of people in the comments saying their condolences as well, that's tragic. And it obviously completely changed the way you go about treating patients and isolating them in the parking lot. Who heard what she said? Where do they place patients outside in what kind of structure? Who heard what she said? In a heated tent, thank you. And can you tell us, Nurse Weller, what is your work schedule? Because I think it's important that students understand that nurses work all kinds of schedules, right? All kinds of hours. Hospitals don't close. So what, what is your schedule right now? Like what does this week look like for you? When, when, when are you working? I am working Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. How many students would want to work a night shift in a hospital? Any hands? That's some. Some. What is the difference between working at night or working during the day? Is there a difference or to you it's just all the same? Um, in the ER, there is a difference. I can't speak for you know, other facilities, but the ER, um, I know at least in, in a trauma center, you, you will see more traumas at night, um, which is why I ultimately wanted to at least start out at nights. Um, so a, a lot of the things like you know, gunshots and stabbings, and those are more nighttime activities for people. So that's sure. a big difference for nighttime. Wow. Question for both of you. This is coming from Crystal Payton Demery. And if, you're, if you heard me say your name, please tell us in the chat. I meant to say, when you put your questions, tell us what school you're from. And Crystal says, 
does your job become overwhelming? Either one of you, we'll talk to you, have different jobs, different focuses every day. We'll start with Nurse Tinner. Does your job become overwhelming? How do you find balance? How do you manage it all? Um, yes, um, being a nurse, it, whether it's home care or in the ER with Ms. Hillary, it can be overwhelming. Um, I, I have a strong support system and I really enjoy what I do. When I see um, my clients smiling faces or they call to thank me for what I'm doing for them, it, it makes it all worthwhile. Um, again, in this field, you have to really love what you're doing and to help people. Um, because when times go overwhelming, you, you have to realize why did you become a nurse in the first place? Thank you very much, Nurse sure. Weller. Uh, how, how do you juggle it? Um, it's, um, you, know, you have ratios that are, um, that don't match up with what they're supposed to be, and that's you, uh, but you will sometimes have four patients and you will sometimes have 12, at least in the ER, uh, but like Nurse Tinner said, it's, it's something that when you walk out at the end of the day and you know you made a difference, um, that's how you handle it, and it's, it's knowing that you had a positive impact on somebody's life um, and then being able to leave the overwhelming situation at work, being able to not take it home with you, which is one of the reasons I wanted to be in the ER. I, I thought I wanted to work with children and then I realized I could not leave that at work. Something about working with children, I, I would take that home. Um, but again, like Nurse Tanner said, this is not a glamorous job. Um, this is a job that you need to want to do. Um, it is a calling, I believe. Um, so that should really be enough for somebody as a nurse is to walk out at the end of the day feeling like you made even the smallest little little bitty difference and that's that's enough to want to come back the next day. Wow that's great. I heard some numbers in there too. She says sometimes she works with patients as, as little as four in a group up to how many? Did we hear that? What number did you hear? Thank you. Look at all these good listeners out there. <laughs> Again numbers are so important and think about the numbers that you own today. How many people you help, how much money you've raised on a fundraiser, how many of this, how many of that. Own your numbers. I want to ask a question to both of you. We'll start with Nurse Weller. Let's say a student uh, becomes an intern and is helping on the floor or, or shadowing. What do you like to see from that young person when they are, you know, just around to learn more about it? What types of uh, their behavior and their characteristics? What do you want to see from young people when they are exploring this field? I'll start with Nurse Weller. Um, my favorite thing to see, I actually have an orientee right now, and my favorite thing to see in her is a questioning attitude, um, whether that's you know, questioning why we're giving certain medications or um, you know, why a patient needs a certain scan or anything like that. Just having questions is a great thing. It shows interest and, um, and it makes you more knowledgeable, which, you know, there's always room for learning, so. Thank you, and I wanna mention, this was a question from a young man, young woman named Kelly Eilis. And again, if you can hear me, put your school in the chat, take credit for that, it was a good question. I'll go to Nurse Tenner, what would you say, if somebody wants to shadow, observe, what do you wanna see from that young person? Um, like um, Nurse Hillary said, a question and attitude, um, a positive attitude, interacting with your patients and your clients. Um, as nurses, it's a scope. We have a scope of practice. So it's stuff that we can do, stuff we cannot do. So if you're orientating and you're not asking questions, well then how do you know what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do? So you have to have a question and attitude. But what I like to see is also you interacting with your patients, asking the patients how they feel in, you know, how their day is. Can I offer you some water, ice? You know, I, I like to see that as well. And it lets me know that, you know, you, you enjoy what you're doing and, and you here to service the patient or client. Thank you very much. Question here from London Johnson for Nurse Weller. Is the ER frantic and busy all the time? Is it crazy all the time? Um, no, not all the time. It's, you know, it, it has its certain hours of the day where it's a lot of times during change of shift, for example, um, it feels very chaotic. Um, but no, it, it's not like that all the time. Um, a, a lot of times, yes, but probably not not quite what you see on TV. It's it's a 
it's a controlled chaos. We all know what we're doing. Um, it looks chaotic from the outside, like as a patient or an outsider, but we all have our jobs and we know what we're doing. There's just a lot happening at once and it looks very busy. Thank you very much. Uh, question for, we'll start with Nurse Tenner. Question here from Sarah Ashley Davidovich. And it's, I'm gonna take your question and sort of shape it into something uh, different. Like if you wanna go into a specialty, okay, a nursing specialty, what, what's the expectation in terms of education and time, you know, versus an RN and then adding on more to that title? Like what, what should you be expecting? And Nurse Tinner, you, you've gained so many degrees in and around this field. So if someone's sort of, they wanna be in a specialty in nursing, what, what should they be planning for? Um, well, with specialty, you, you have to do your research. Um, you have to know what that entails. Um, it also helps, um, if, especially if you're in school, to get with your instructor to see if you can do an internship um, or a preceptorship ship, uh, with a hospital or whatever specialty you want to go into um, to see if the instructor can possibly um, get in contact with someone so you could possibly um, do that preceptorship. Um, I know when I was in nursing school, I was um, I had a preceptorship with um, um, dialysis, um, ER, um, the OR. Um, the great thing about nursing school is that especially for your clinicals, you have the opportunity to see so many specialties so you can decide which one you really want to go into. And if you keep that contact with your instructors and let them know what specialty you really want to go into, nine times out of 10, they're going to try to at least give you your top three picks um, for your specialty. Wonderful. Here's an uh, interesting question. I can't read the student's name, but I'm going to ask it uh, on their behalf. We'll go with Nurse Weller. Do you ever get attached to your patients emotionally? Yes, you, I do. Again, this is actually going back to what I said before, um, why I chose the ER. I felt for me to be able to come back every day and to, to not burn out. Um, I, I did a rotation on ICU. I thought that's what I wanted to do, but you have a lot more time one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes over several days with your patients. And um, I had a difficult time detaching when I went home at the end of the day. So you do get attached to your patients in the ER, but the nice part about it is you're only gonna have them for that 12 hour shift. Sometimes you have them for an hour, sometimes it's the full 12, but at the end of the day, you know, you're know you not coming back to the same patient, which for me was helpful. If, if you're the type of person who wants that attachment and won't take it home with you, then you know ICU or pediatrics or anything like that would be you know, more for you than it was for me, but I needed ER to be able to not burn out at bedside. Thank you very much. I'll ask another good question from Camila Jimenez. I'll ask it to Nurse Tinner. How do you cope with making mistakes? Um, wow, that's good a good question, question, right? That's a yes. good one. Sorry, I know I threw you a curveball with that one, but let's <laughs> that's a good question. give it a shot. Yes, as, as nurses, we make mistakes. Um, nobody's perfect um we just have to own up to it um in home care especially with the field that i'm in um when it comes to making mistakes thankfully i'm not putting a person in in danger um versus someone like nurse hillary working in the er so again sometimes we make mistakes nobody's perfect but if you make a mistake own up to it let someone know that you made a mistake to see if they can help you fix it because again especially in, depending on what um, specialty you're in you can actually put the client at, at risk patient at risk and you put yourself at risk as well thank you i do see we have a young person using some inappropriate language in the chat if you could please stop doing that everybody would appreciate it we're, we're wrapping up with our discussion in just a few moments um let me see here we had some other well nurse, nurse weller why don't you chime in on that too you know this idea that no, nobody's perfect even though you you've been trained up and these are intense moments you still make mistakes how do you grapple with that absolutely um just like um, nurse tinner said um owning up to that mistake sooner rather than later is extremely important because you have the, you have the capability to um, fix your mistake or correct the mistake. But you know, if 
you give a medication that's incorrect, for example, the longer the patient has that in the system and you're not correcting it, um, the more serious that's going to be. So learning how to um, own up to the mistakes is, is a huge, huge deal. Um, and being able to tell the right people and take the, the necessary steps to correct that and minimize the consequences is important. Thank you. Another good question here, Julia Mercado says, how do you try and create a great patient experience? We'll start with Nurse Weller on that. Um, that that's a really good question. Um, we have a lot of customer service classes about that, um, especially in the ER, that's sometimes hard to do with, with ratios being so, um, so unfortunate, but, but a large part of creating that experience is smile, um, you know, apologize for things that don't necessarily go a certain way. Um, a lot of people, you know, they come into the ER thinking that their problem is, is the most important problem. And to them it is. And, and acknowledging that and respecting that, even though um, they might not be the most important out of the, you know, 50 other patients in your waiting room, to them, their problem is the most important and they are scared. And just being able to acknowledge that and make them feel important, um, you know, regardless of everything else that you have going on and just making, making each patient and their family feel important. Communicating is a huge deal. Sometimes they're waiting 12 hours before anything happens. So just communicating to them, um, communicating to the physicians and just keeping them in the know with their treatment is important. Thank you very much. I want to have sort of a, a wrap up question for both of you. And then I want to share with students an effective thank you note and what that looks like when you're done with meeting somebody in this type of situation. So let's just kind of take the big picture here. You have students who are looking at you, you're in the field, you're, you're professionals, you've been out there experienced. What, what is your best advice to students right now, if you, know, if you were in their shoes, to recommend them to take some steps to go towards this field? What would you suggest that they do sort of big picture? I'll start with Nurse Tinner. What, what, what should they do from today moving forward? Well, I would say I would love for everyone to be in the nursing field because we really do need good nurses. Um, but I, I will tell you to basically life is short. You need to do what makes you happy and what brings you satisfaction. And if it is being a nurse, why do you want to be a nurse? My main reason for being a nurse was the care that my mom received and me being a nurse for 20 years, I, I can see that I, I know that I made a difference. Um, so I, I guess overall, why do you want to be a nurse? Why do you want to be a physician? Why do you want to be a neurosurgeon? You really have to do some soul searching. Why do you want to do that? Because it's going to take a lot of classes, a lot of degrees, and I'll, basically one time I called myself a professional student, <laughs> Because the whole idea was go to school. So it's like you don't want to go to school. And it's nothing wrong with getting a degree in something and changing to something else. It's nothing wrong with that. But I would tell you, whatever you want to do, why do you want to do it? Do you see yourself making a difference? And if you see yourself making a difference, well, then you do what you have to do to get that degree. And to all the students, congrats. I'm so happy for all of you. And I wish you all much success. Thank you very much. And this is one of the questions on our worksheet. When you talk about when you're writing someone a thank you to share some of the advice that they gave you. And I heard a great piece of advice right there, which is, why do you want to be a nurse? Start to think about you know, what, does, what is it that inspires and motivates you? That's a great place to start when you start thinking about your future. So think about that. If you were to put together a thank you message, maybe you would include advice like that. Nurse Weller, what would you say to students? Maybe they want to work in the ER labor and delivery, you know, they, they want to be like in the hospital setting, in the thick of it, how should they proceed from, from here? Um, so, like I mentioned before, I would, you know, start looking into those prerequisites if, if you are sure that nursing is for you. If you're not sure, um, finding places that you can shadow, um, like Nurse Tinner was saying, doing your research is, is hugely important. Um, like, I know that Mr. Rubin has, has spoken to all of you about, um, you know, doing your research and communicating. And I, I just want to let you all know that I actually got my job only because of, not only because, but the thing that stood out from the other applicants was my thank you note. 
So that is great. Ah. Um, and they will ask you, I got at least three to four questions at my interview um, about certain things about the hospital. So knowing about the place that you want to work is, is hugely important. Definitely do that research. It will um, make you stand out from a lot of other applicants. That's what a perfect segue, because the last thing I want to show, and thank you for that, is to show the students, and I've shown this before. Hold on a second. Get this out of the way. I've shown this before, but we talk a lot in our, in our curriculum that I mentioned at the beginning, teaching, giving students lots and lots of examples of templates to work from. And one that we talk about is how to thank someone after, for instance, a job interview. Okay, and let's talk about that thank you message and what could be included. So we say, as I said, I'm interested in the position. I'd like to learn more about your team. And then you reference a moment from the conversation. In this case, hold on one second, because I, I can't move my chat. Hold on, <laughs> let me get my screen. Okay, so we want to reference something from our conversation, something that we learn, right? Like, like Nurse Weller just said. So in this case, it's like I learned about the company's push for eco-friendly products. Something that took place, something that you gleaned, something that you held on to. Reiterate that in your message. Don't just say thank you very much. It was great to meet you and let that be it. Add some details, right? Like she just said, she added some details about what she learned from the interview process. She made it special and customized to the person reading it and that made all the difference. Is that correct, Nurse Weller? Because you made it special, they remembered you? That is correct. He, um, my manager now actually referenced a TED talk that he had seen and recommended it. So I went home and I watched the TED talk. And then in my thank you note, I referenced the TED talk and that I had watched it. And, and ah. so you, you showed the person how much you appreciate what they have to say. And what do you know? They hired you. Right. So sometimes in life, it's about talking about yourself, but it's also learning how to value others. And that's when people get excited and want to bring you in as part of the team. Now, the last thing I want to share is what I said at the beginning, that offer to the teachers, okay? If you can recall, we have, click on it, we have a virtual internship guide we've put together teaching students how to set up these conversations, hold these conversations, write thank you notes, put this information on their resume. It's a Google folder guide we've put together and a, a email etiquette lesson plan that you can use also from a Google folder, teaching students the parts of an email, how to compose an email. It's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge today that students understand that texting and emailing are not the same thing. And so we have put this together. If you missed our offer at the beginning, all you have to do is go to the chat and put in your name. This is for teachers, your name and your email as a teacher, and we will send this to you in a Google folder link. What we like to do, if we haven't met before, never, never learned about us in our material, we like to have a quick two minute conversation with a Google invite over the next few days to say hello, provide it to you and your students and get you using some of these skills in the classroom. So look out for that Google invite. And if you're okay with talking on Martin Luther King Day, which is on Monday, say so in the chat so we can schedule for that day because I know many schools are, well, schools are closed. Also, don't forget, on the 28th, we're talking about the world of the trades. We're gonna be talking to two people who work in the apprenticeship world. The specific focus is electrical contracting, but it could be any type of trade work and the value of the apprentice program and going into that field right from school and making a great salary, having a, a stable career uh, in the trades and a variety of occupations. So let me come back to our chat and we will wrap up in just a moment. We always try to finish right at the you know, 2 15 Eastern time and 11 15 Pacific time. And I, I want to say again, thank you to our wonderful guests. I thought they gave us excellent advice. Raise your hands if you thought our guests were, were awesome today, gave us such good information. Ooh, so many hands, 100, 200 hands just shot up in this chat. So we, we have a lot of students who, who genuinely appreciated what you had to tell them. They had more questions that I could even fit into this conversation. Apologies for some of the chats that were not so friendly. We're gonna work on that for future webinars. The crowds get bigger and we have to have a plan for that.
So we will work on that, but thank you for all of your contributions. And again, for the teachers who expressed interest in our material, we'll be in touch very shortly. And students, we hope you enjoyed it and that we will see you at future sessions. Let me just give you a little tease, okay? We are gonna be talking to people who work in the trades, as I told you. Also gaming. Who wants to learn about working in the gaming industry? Video games, software development. Oh yeah. What about the film industry? Talking to people who work in the film industry, law enforcement, law, agriculture, cybersecurity. It's all in our webinar schedule now through May. So teachers, keep an eye on your email when we put out new registration pages for these events and tell teachers in your school if it doesn't apply to your exact career path. But we have a lot of good stuff coming. Okay. Once again, thank you very much. And we will let you all go back to your, your day, your classroom, your living room, wherever you are. Thank you again to our guests and to Ms. Cunningham for her excellent work as well.